Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Stripe Dev Live. My name is Paul Ashus, and on this monthly show, we talk to interesting people about interesting things. So normally we host this on Discord, but we thought we'd try something different today and have it live on Twitter Spaces instead. Today, we are joined by Alex Komoroske and our very special guest, Tara Sesha, who are here to chat and answer any questions you might have about products and platform. If you'd like to ask our panel any questions, you can either request to speak in this space or you can send me a Twitter DM directly if you're feeling shy and I'll just read out your question directly. First though, let's let our guests probably introduce themselves. Tara, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi. Um, really excited to be here. Um, as Paul mentioned, my name is Tara. I currently lead product at a company called Watershed, uh, which is a company that builds software tools uh, to enable businesses to cut carbon. And prior to working at Watershed, um, I worked at Stripe actually for, for a bit, um, building lots of the products that surround payments. Um, and prior to Stripe, um, had worked in sort of the digital health, healthcare software tools space um, on like various startup projects of my own. So glad to have you on the show. Thank you again for coming. Alex, could you give us a quick 30 a second intro on yourself? Sure. So hi, I'm Alex Komorowski. I am, uh, my career up to this point has been as a product manager, primarily at Google. Uh, for about eight years, I led Chrome's web platform PM team working on Blink and a lot of our externally facing uh, web standards and things that we did in the, in the broader web ecosystem. Then I worked on augmented reality, ambient computing, and I'm now at Stripe uh, working on corporate strategy. Excellent. Thank you both very much. I want to start us off by just a very simple icebreaker, uh, which is what is your favorite product you have worked on? Tara, I'd love to hear from you. What is your favorite product you've worked on? And no cheating by saying the one that you're currently working on. Ah, okay. Um, my favorite product that I worked on um, was actually at Stripe. Um, I worked on Stripe's billing product and got that up and running back in the day. Um, if you can like you know, recall back to 2015 or maybe even 2014. Um, Stripe kind of had a subscriptions product, but it wasn't uh, meeting users' needs pretty much at all. And so we launched a new version of that called Billing that still exists today um, with lots of fun features like invoicing and revenue recognition and all kinds of stuff. Um, it was fun because, uh, you know, I think recurring revenue is the best type of revenue you can have. Um, and very much uh, inhabited uh, that philosophy as a, as a passion. Um, I think I got way too into it, actually. Um, but it was my favorite product because we got to do something kind of net new um, that users really wanted that had a ton of like pain associated with it. And it's in a space where there's actually a lot of um, alternatives. And so figuring out how Stripe could be different, how it could add value to users in a way that um, others might not be was kind of a really exciting challenge. It's it's really weird to think of that there was a point in time with Stripe that we did <laughs> not have a recurring billing product. Like it, it just seems so wild. That was not a thing for a long time. I know. Yes. <laughs> it was like when we launched it, it was like, of course, this exists. Like, thank God we have it now. It, I mean, it must have been a, bit of a pretty big splash as well when you finally did announce it, right? Um, I mean, it was a splash and it, in both a good way and a bad way, but I can talk about that. <laughs> That's another <laughs> point. That's a long story. One which we can definitely get into. Uh, but first, Alex, can you please tell me what is, or tell us, what is your favorite product you've worked on? Yeah, it's funny that, Tara, yours totally resonated with me, too. I find that a lot of the products that I found were most interesting were things that seemed so obvious, like you were just responding to such an obvious, concrete need that it kind of felt like, a well, duh, like, I can't believe you didn't have this before. I think every product I've worked on, even the ones I, worked, I started working on, I'm like, this is kind of going to be a lame thing. Or I don't really care about this space that much. Over time, as a product manager, I think you just get so attached to the space and to the challenges of the users that you're working with that like you just get really attached to it and it gets really exciting. I think one of, of if I had to pick a single favorite, it would be when I worked on uh, Live View on Google Maps, the augmented reality feature in Google Maps. And that was a really challenging product in a lot of ways because it was uh, unlike something, anything that had been done before really, I mean, this really interesting technology that allowed very precise global positioning that allowed you us to show you know, where to turn 
uh, to, in the street, you know, when, uh, when you're walking somewhere. And I thought that team was just amazing because uh, some phenomenal people I worked with, uh, like Rachel Inman and Joanna Kim and uh, Merrick Gorecki and Casey Kleins and a number of other amazing people. And we just, uh, what I liked about it was that we were all charting into the space that nobody had actually asked for precisely. <laughs> um, we just thought it, that we had, there was a potential to add some real interesting user value and I'm really proud of what we ended up shipping. Uh, and as, like the thing that made me really proud was after we shipped it, we got so many tweets from people who were like, this thing changed my life. And like, I completely like, and I can now do things I wouldn't have done, been able to do before. It's like, this is like an augmented reality walking de- directions kind of thing. But it's just really cool to see people respond to it and be like, wow, we actually did find a really useful thing to do for, for people. So that's my favorite. And, and I wonder on the flip side, you got a lot of tweets, people saying this is the best thing I've ever seen. I wonder how many tweets you got of people saying that, wait, that's it? Or, hey, I was expecting more, because that always seems to happen. Yes, everyone always has these expectations of like, oh, do you think this is magic? <laughs> this is really hard to make this thing work in the first place. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so moving on, I have a couple of questions for you guys. Uh, so um, a little while ago in something called the Flux Review, which is a publication that the two of you actually work on, um, there was a very interesting article from uh, John Cleese of Monty Python fame, where he talked about uh, creativity. It was a, a, a transcript of a talk that he gave a number of years ago. And one of the uh, big takeaways that I had from that particular article was that uh, his conclusion of like how to be creative was essentially just giving yourself time to think, where you just schedule time where you're not ne- t- intending to necessarily accomplish something. Thing, you're just giving yourself time to think. And I wonder, because um, a lot of thinking must go into creating good products. A lot of thinking, like, you know, thinking about the future of products and thinking about how uh, how you want to strategize from products. And I wonder if you, the two of you, uh, uh, have a similar thought process of like how much, giving yourself time to think. Tara, maybe you want to uh, start us off there? Yeah, um, it's, it's a really interesting question because I think oftentimes if you give yourself simply time to think without any sort of stimulus associated with it, uh, that time can feel very empty um, or it can feel as if you're not getting the right, you're, you're not using that time effectively. I find actually thinking time is best when interspersed with like time of activity or time of mm-hmm. collecting lots of stimulus and interesting open questions and talking to users or mm-hmm. reading about the market, like just absorbing something. And then my thinking time, um, maybe the initial parts of it are thinking in reaction to the things that I've observed. And mm-hmm. then maybe the middle part of it is, is synthesizing the things I've observed and figuring out what's next. And then the last part is, all right, what net new do, ideas do I have to either build on this or uh, build in a different direction? And so at least it's hard for me to to take thinking time in absence of having received any sort of directional stimulus. But I think I found it to be most effective if I can like get a bit of stimulus and then get space to think. Mm-hmm. Um, Alex and I had talked about in the past of like the sort of explore versus exploit kind of trade off, um, which is, you know, important when you're like, training algorithms, but also kind of important as you're thinking about building products, like there's a phase where you want to uh, be in that exploration mode of like absorbing new content and thinking about new ideas and not necessarily pushing for a single objective and times when it's like push for a single objective and like get as far as possible and making that objective happen. Um, and so less of like a, I, I think you just need that balance. It's, it's really hard to have one or the other. hundred percent agreed. Like the I find that like, you know, people who know me in, in conversations, I'm often kind of a lot of energy and uh, I, I meet with a lot of people on my calendar is pretty packed normally. And what I normally do is I'll try to have like four days of my week are just packed with meetings and execution on ideas, moving balls forward and stuff. And then for a long time, I would have Fridays, I'd work from home. And that was my time of just synthesis and no meetings and unpacking and kind of stewing in all the different things I'd absorbed that week and just reflecting and reading documents and riffing to myself about what things resonated. But I found it, it was really important to have that busy and then recovery and then busy and then recovery. And that the busyness gave you all these ideas that were bubbling. And then when you gave them a little bit more space to bubble out, you know, on Friday, you'd be like, wow, what an interesting connection across these three things. And now that I think about it, actually, this thing is um, such an obvious outcome uh, of this or what have you. I, I think it's funny, 
uh, I've been doing, I, I did that for many, many years. I started doing that back maybe in 2010 or something. And at the time people would say, oh yeah, quote unquote working on Friday. And it's like, first of all, like I, I have, I, I like, I'm confident enough in my abilities to know that, you know, people, for people to not think that I'm just kind of slacking off at that time, but also that time to synthesize, to figure out like how to make sense of what you've just experienced is I think the most important time. That's when the interesting ideas come out, like the interesting game changing ideas. And I think it's easy in the moment to say, well, I don't have time for that. And if you don't have time to do some of the synthesis and connecting up the ideas and figuring out kind of the interesting nuggets and interesting leverage points that come out of it, then you, you know you look up a few years later and you're like, wait a second, I've just been executing myself into a corner or, or missing a bunch of really great ideas. So I think it's really, it's important. And it, it feels very self-indulgent, I think, in the moment. And I think it's important to like, not to allow yourself to say, no, this is a good thing. It's not just me being self-indulgent. So. So what, what I'm hearing is the idea, idea of having a no meetings day is actually, it, it, it helps creativity, doesn't it? Where um, if, you, if, if you don't give yourself time to kind of let the ideas kind of swirl around in your mind and kind of make connections, that as you say, you, you kind of lose track of, of maybe what's important. Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I fundamentally agree with that. And I think a lot of times the stuff that makes things very sustainable and allows you to have sort of positive exposure to great ideas are precisely the things that in the moment look like, you know, like, oh, that's someone who wants to take it easy. No, 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 that's not what's going on. That's that's specifically me giving myself the space to, to synthesize and to chew on those ideas and figure out the interesting thing, threads to pull on. I like I like the mental image of chewing on an idea and really kind of you know, savoring it and, and getting <laughs> every single flavor out of it. Um, but then kind of on the flip side of that is giving yourself time to think is one thing. But I think that one problem that a lot of people might come across is the like, decision paralysis, where you, when do you make the decision of now it's time to stop thinking and actually make some real uh, uh, decisions about your product or about your uh, like your plan over the year? When when do you know like when is thinking time over and decision time is now. Tara, you got any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I don't know if I have a hard and fast rule for it. It almost is like a, there's like a gut feel thing of like, all right, it's it's time to like move into action. Of course, there's like the Jeff Bezos framework of like, is this a, you know, a trapdoor decision or not? And if it's a trapdoor decision, then it bears any extra thinking you want to give to it. And if it's not, then like you should probably bias towards like trying something or getting something out there. I find actually like most PMs are um, not the type of folks who are afraid of maybe making the decision. In fact, it's like actually like taking the time to think a little bit. That might be the the issue. Um, but I think I think as you're thinking through a problem, you might have a hypothesis that is this is the decision that I would make. But I'm just trying to like figure out if there's if I'm thinking just in the local maxima, if there's anything broader. And so oftentimes, at least when I'm um, brainstorming these questions, especially if it's like fairly tactical and something where I need to call a decision, I do have like a straw dog in mind um, to some extent. What, what do you mean by straw dogs? <laughs> uh, like a straw man, like uh, like this is my hypothesis going into this discussion. The hope of like just or this you know brainstorming period. My hope in this brainstorming period, either alone or with others, is to check whether my hypothesis I like you know, muscled into a hypothesis too fast, or if my hypothesis kind of bears the weight of uh, critique. And so when it comes time to make a decision, it is a call of, okay, did I expand my world enough to figure if my hypothesis makes sense? And a call of like, you know, do I have sufficient evidence such that this is plausible enough for the thing that I want to do? And then if I feel both of those things are true, then like time to move to a decision. I love that framing, Tara. Like, and that's very similar with how I try to do it like the, I'm, I always have a hypothesis at the beginning. It's very weak. It's like, well, very weakly held hypothesis of like, if someone said you have to act right now, that I could say, okay, here's my bet. I would bet of these options. I would do this thing. This is the thing I think is the least likely, the most likely to move it in a good direction that we don't, that causes good things to happen that we don't regret. And then I think you have to seek disconfirming evidence, like try to falsify that hypothesis. If it's wrong, what would you hear? And then go out of your way to find that, like talk to the person who seems to be the least convinced and sit with them one-on-one -on -one and like try to unpack what they're saying and make sure that you're hearing what they're saying. And if once you stop, stop getting surprising and if you are actively searching for surprising and disconfirming evidence 
and you stop getting it, that's a pretty good sign that you've got a pretty good handle on it and that you can just do it. I think also people often make these decisions way too big. You're constantly making micro decisions all the time. Like, and those like micro decisions should be not a big deal, actually. They should be very like small little bets that are quite safe and you're adjacent possible and very, very unlikely to be a thing that you regret, uh, you know, that you regret in the long term. And that's why, you know, as you're, as you're going through it, I find that like you're developing a better and better intuition about where the long-term direction you want to go in is, where the dangerous regions are that you want to make sure you really stay clear of. And then a lot of it's just constantly making decisions and actions going by your gut. And like whenever you find surprising information, like, okay, I need to pause. I need to absorb that information because it does not fit with my hypothesis. I need to like see if that changes, you know, recalibrates me about what I feel like is a good idea. So just as a reminder to everyone in the audience that uh, if you do want to pipe in, if you want to ask a question or so, just uh, hit that button and uh, let you speak. But um, kind of to, to build up on that, Alex, you said that, you know, uh, rather than making big decisions, you have to make these small mini decisions as you go along the way. But uh, that kind of leads into my next question for you is that, uh, you know, how do you, it kind of falls into like uh, uh, making big decisions with like planning. For instance, you know, everyone's heard of like, you know, having a one year plan versus a three year or a five year. But um, sometimes plans do, you know, have like a wrench thrown in. And I wonder with you guys, when it comes to planning stuff for the future, obviously um, you try to plan for everything that, that could potentially go wrong. But what happens if we get like these big black swan events, like for instance, the, the pandemic that just happened, right? How, how, do you, how do you plan for that? Or do you just not? And I find that like, I think people often think that strategy means coming up with a very concrete plan and then executing on it. I think that's very rarely, it's almost almost exactly the opposite of what it means. Like you're, the plan is like a meta plan. It's like, okay, we're roughly going in that direction and we're going to keep on responding to like concrete things that are good ideas that nudge us in that direction under the assumption that like, yeah, it's, that you're, like, it's not even like a black swan event. It's like all the time things are going to happen. You have no idea. You're going to constantly be had like little micro wrenches thrown in your path. And if you're assuming that you can just put your head down and just fully execute without uh, looking for, uh, you know, for six months or a year or something, like you're probably wrong. Like you should be constantly looking up and just verify, okay, is everything roughly, is it like surprising what's going on around me? And if, if so, then like pause. But so I, I think that people, you should, you should explicitly plan for it to be a co-evolved, like adaptive stance that you're doing that's roughly shooting off like a North Star direction that you're going. There is um, every single planning, like corporate planning thing I've been involved in. Like a, I say every single one because I can probably think of literally one example where this wasn't true. Someone brings out this like very, at this point, tired Eisenhower quote. That's like plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And like every single you know, ridiculous planning corporate deck has this quote at the front of it, they might as well just like build it into the slide template. So if anyone works at Google, you know, that's the action I'm suggesting to you. Um, <laughs> and that quote is like, very annoying, but it's actually, you know, now that I think about it, I think the content is right. And it deeply pains me to say this. So like, know that at least. But yeah, it's kind of it plans are worthless. And planning is everything like that. That totally makes sense. It's like the process of coming up with a hey, this is what we want to do is useful such that when like new evidence comes in the door, you can think about does this update the probability that my hypothesis is true? It like makes total sense. So one it kind of it kind of reminds me of that uh, Mike Tyson quote that uh, everyone's <laughs> got to plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're constantly getting punched in the face, right? Like the likelihood you don't get punched in the face is like basically zero if you're doing anything interesting. Like, and Tara, to that point, uh, I was just talking with somebody the other day, and they pointed out anything that becomes a cliche, the reason it became a cliche is because it was novel and interesting so that people wanted to share it, and then it became just, like, a thing that everybody knew so well they rolled their eyes at it. So, like, any phrase that, like, I'm like, ugh, everybody's said this a million times, I try to think of myself, oh, okay, well, like, let me look at this with fresh eyes, because actually this is saying a really useful thing, you know? Like, uh there's uh, so many cliches now. I look at them like, oh, that actually really is an interesting insight. I just completely have become blind to it because I just roll my eyes whenever I hear it because it's so cliche at this point, you know? You know, but there, do... I want to be cool and I want to, you know, say the cliche idea, but in like a fresh way that, you know, doesn't seem like a cliche anymore. So I have to just fight against my, you know, my desire to seem like, oh, I've, you know, discovered this cool new thing when really- Yeah, look at this fresh, fresh take about. I've gotten. Everyone's like, that's the, the most cliche <laughs> thing you've ever ever said. Yeah. <laughs> but how, how do you guys feel about um, when it comes to um, 
formulating plans for the future. So it, it seems like making a one-year plan or a six-month plan seems like, uh, uh, you know, you could probably do it. But do you shy away from like three to five-year plans? And and if you do do long-term plans, how do they differ from just like a, a, a North Star pie in the sky concept? Oh, man, the very last thing I worked on while at Stripe um, was like a 10-year plan. And so context on this is prior to coming to Stripe, I worked on a startup um, in healthcare that had the Mayo Clinic as an investor. And the Mayo Clinic made like 20-year plans. So for folks who aren't familiar, the Mayo Clinic is like a very uh, highly reputed like medical institution that has all these great medical centers and innovation and you know medical school, et cetera, et cetera. And so I remember being at like tiny startups saying, oh my God, if I'm ever writing a 20 year plan, like kill me now. I like don't want to live in that environment. Um, <laughs> but now, you know, with like the additional gray hairs that, that I have, I think, you know, like for an organization like the Mayo Clinic that's been around for like a gajillion years, having a 20 year plan makes a ton of sense. And they're in an industry, aka healthcare and medicine, that is like unlikely to like rapidly change. And in fact, not having something like a 20 year plan means that in terms of making the right capital investments or making the right like research investments, you're probably not going to do the right thing. Like basic science takes a long time. Um, and so I think making longer and longer term plans just really reflects the maturity of your industry and maybe the, um, the like decisions you have to make as an organization. Like when you're a really small startup, you're kind of hoping that the vector is pointed in the right direction. And that's probably as like good as you want to get. But when you're a larger company, I think you realize that those initial decisions that you made that you were initially making just for survival and is the direction right, um, become decisions that deeply affect things five years down the road in unforeseen ways. And so you try mm-hmm. to make those unforeseen second order effects, things that you can at least predict And so when you're doing this long term planning, you're trying to think about how will the world be different in that time and like how the decisions we make now compound somehow uh, to react to that future world. Um, But, you know, inappropriate in the case of like a small startup. Sorry, go ahead, Alex. The way I think about this is like you want to plan, have some awareness of the full timescale on which the thing that you are affiliated with right now is expected to still be around. So if you were part of the Mayo Clinic, clinic, will the Mayo Clinic be around in 20 years? Well, I sure hope so. So yes, you should be thinking to some degree a little bit about at least what 20 years in the future looks like. If your startup has three months of runway left and you don't currently aren't in a path where you're going to be able to raise more funding, then like don't think about like five years in the future because you probably won't be around. So like, you, like you're, you're calibrating it based on what is a reasonable expectation of how long, like the existential runway of the team that you are on or the product or the company that you're with. I think the other thing is that um, the further it gets into the future, the lower the resolution should be. So I think sometimes people get really specific about things in like 10 years and like, well, uh, you know, is this number going to be 29.8 or like 30.2 in 10 years? Like I can guarantee you it won't be either of those numbers. And like, that's not the right frame to think about that. The time horizons, like the error bars in that are just uh, absurd. But what is useful to think about is painting a picture of things that you can, like I, an ideal North Star, in my opinion, is relatively low resolution. It's like two pages of like relatively abstract, unnamed things, no pretty pictures or mocks because bad ideas can hide behind pretty pictures. And then it's something that everybody you talk to uh, when you're seeking disconfirming evidence looks at the thing and goes, yeah, that would be a good outcome or a great outcome if that were to happen. And yeah, I can see how a world in which that's non-miraculous. And that shows you that you're grounded enough. There's a plausible path to that thing. And also it's a reasonably good thing to do like it's a it would be yeah if we achieve that in 10 years that would be pretty sweet um but like it's really important to hold it very lightly and have not too much resolution because otherwise it's going to totally distract you and become like a cage of like well our 10-year plan says so and so it's like yeah well, we don't know a lot more than we did now you know when we wrote that you know so n- no no pretty pictures in your two-pager i feel like every designer who's listening in just frowned at you over the internet uh, I actually see a couple in here. I see a, a Rod uh, who just joined, and I think that, uh, but like, I, I think he knows that I love the. I think you can have a a nice uh, vision. I think that is cohesive and coherent. But like, I think it's very easy to trick yourself with just pretty pictures if you do it incorrectly. But of course, it can be a very useful tool if done responsibly. <laughs> But do you think that in the tech industry, we're sort of doomed to never be able to plan more than, say, two years into the future just because of uh, uh, pace layering and just how quickly this industry moves? I, I think that you can make a 
this is now going to sound super off in the weeds and kind of kooky, but I think that you can make a case uh, and it reduces down to like the second law of thermodynamics and like what computability theory that like it's fundamentally impossible to to estimate too far into the future. Like it's just it's a complex system that is extremely uh, tied to its initial state. And so like even if you had a perfect supercomputer, you still wouldn't be able to, com to compute it to the level of detail necessary. So I think like it's a fact of like the universe that we live in that there's just going to be a fair bit of uncertainty. And that uncertainty, I think, is, is scary. It is an existentially terrifying thing to, to, to sit with. I think what happens a lot of times is when we work on strategy. People will say sometimes, oh, I'm really data driven. That's good. But what that often means is uh, it's almost like using the data as like a comfort blanket to pretend like we have more certainty than we actually do because it's terrifying to think about the fact that we don't. And so I think it's easy to sometimes get stuck in those, those, kinds, of, um, those kinds of corners where you think you're being really rigorous and actually you're being exactly the opposite. I don't know if that resonates with you or if that... No, that, that totally does. I think it's often useful if you just frame it as an if. They're like, all right, if this happens, then I would think about this type of thing as opposed to when. Um, so like... If this happens, I'll do this rather than when this happens, I'll do this because it's really hard to know the when, especially per your point, if you're talking quite a bit of time out. But it's useful to kind of know, all right, kind of hedging here. We sort of have this in our back pocket. If this happens, I have this tool available to me, that kind of stuff. Yeah, 100%. And, and being like being aware of what you would do if that thing happened. And sometimes the thing that you would do if that thing happened is like, like you know what would you do differently now like nothing it's like cool fine then you're fine you don't have to worry about it like you can i think people often are like well kicking a can down the road is a bad idea it's like not if the road is like tilted downward and the thing will roll further like if the problem is going to get easier and easier to figure out that what the right thing is to do as time goes on then like kick that can down the road you don't need to figure it out right now you can safely ignore that that issue because in the fullness of time it will become way easier to make the call of what what to do and you don't need to make a decision now you and I have talked about a thing before that's like, um, what are the waves that you sort of like being a maker or taker of trends as you think about the future? Mm -hmm. um, like, what are the things that you expect to receive and take and therefore relies on your ability to predict or your ability to say, actually, I'm going to wait this out. I have no clue. Like, this might get easier over time. So let's hold versus like things that you want to be really opinionated about making happen. Um, where you actually kind of need to not only predict the future, but you are trying to like manifest for lack mm -hmm. of a better term a future. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like you have a few of those bets to make, but oftentimes like that is the thing that'll move your product or your strategy or your company, which is like, no, 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 we are adamant that we are going to try to make this future into a reality. Um, and that's the thing we're going to plan for and push on really heavily. Yeah. I like thinking of it as like nudges or like co-evolving that thing. So like, Hey, this thing is currently like this and we're going to like, try to push it in this other direction towards this other thing, a trend that we think should be happening and would be good to happen. I think people sometimes get confused and they'll do like UXR and it will come back with like, okay, well, users want this, that, and the other thing. And then people kind of accidentally play that, those requests forward. And it's like, no, no, UXR gives you the constraints of people's expectations and desires today. But you might be able to change that desire by um, if you have a, a feature that a small number of people will start using and then they tell their friends and they change their expectations about what, what the feature will do. And like you can co-evolve that demand and be a, a you know, a, um, a maker of that trend to some degree. And so it's really easy to get stuck into this thing that says, well, the UXR says that this thing is not something that someone will want in two years. Like they don't know. Like it might be that like you could get to the place where you can develop it so that people actually do want that that demand there's lots of there's lots of patterns to do that in like cleverly you know one pattern that i wrote up in the um the uh that doorbell in the jungle essay from a couple weeks ago was you hide a feature behind that's relatively hard to find and then the users who co go to it but will buy will be self-selecting the most engaged users and then you kind of watch what things they do via your stats of like oh what what features are they using and what things they seem to like and then that gives you some signal to figure out when you're above a quality bar that you would like to start taking that feature and having a, an affordance at the main screen that helps lead more users to it. And so you can get that. The, um, and that's an example of like the end users might not be asking for that right now, but some self-selecting subset of users might go and find it. Uh, and then from there, you can watch how they're using it and figure out how, how to um, kind of create more of that demand or push more on that. 
So I'm actually really glad that you brought up uh, doorbells in the jungle. Um, for everyone listening, if you've not read Alex's essay on this, I highly recommend you do. Uh, it's a great, it's a short read. It's great. Um, but Alex is hoping that you can not give us a quick, sub, quick, quick summary of um, the vertical versus horizontal approaches in your product, which is, which, correct me if I'm wrong, is kind of the crux of your arguments in doorbells in the jungle. Yeah, and that's the frame I used in the gardening platforms deck as well. I think that the vast majority of, of development of features is done in a kind of what I'd call a vertical fashion. It's a specific use case done deeply. And I find that another approach is kind of this horizontal approach that gives you exposure to lots of different possibilities. Uh, and it just feels totally different. So actually that, that essay at Tara, I don't know if you, I, maybe you know this, I, I just riffed and used that frame in one of our conversations a number of months ago. And like later you're like, oh yeah, the doorbell in the jungle. I was like, oh wow, that was just a random riff. Like I don't... I, uh, and so that you were the reason I decided to write that up and like develop that idea because of uh, you riffing on it with me. Wow, I'm so honored. <laughs> <laughs> she said so like, authentic. Um, but I think part of it is that if you don't, if you're sitting there debating where, where you're going to get value of it, if it's not that expensive for you to put these little um, kind of doorbells out there, that's if someone rang it, you everyone agrees would be a good thing to do. The doorbell is pretty cheap. Like put it there. And then if you get concrete demand coming in, then it becomes way simpler strategically to say, hey, like someone rang that doorbell and like we didn't think it was going to happen, but like it did. And we all agree that like that would be great if it happened. So like now we can build out a little bit of that feature for that concrete demand that we now know exists, as opposed to sitting there talking forever about, um, you know, what use cases are going to be the most interesting. Like, I think people often make it so much harder than it has to be. But I think, um, and so just to recap for our, for our, our listeners here, that uh, the idea of a doorbell in the jungle is um, essentially that you, you, yeah, you give access to or give users or customers the opportunity to interact or buy something from you in ways they prob- that you probably wouldn't expect. But um, part of the, the, the story in your article is um, your, your, your main character essentially uh, puts up of their own volition, puts, puts a doorbell in the jungle and is sort of allowed to do this. But um, it, it turns out well, spoiler, it turns out well for that particular employee in the story. But um, what if it doesn't? So what, what if you have these doorbells that nobody ends up ringing? Isn't that just another form of technical debt? So I think that's a great question. And Tari, actually, the, you brought up a number of, of... Uh, like downsides of this approach in some cases. But I think part of it is they have to be actually cheap. Like if they aren't actually cheap and they are expensive to build or maintain, they don't count. Like you, it has to be something that is a extremely, like a, a sign-up form on a documentation that is very easy to maintain or something. Um, and Tara, you pointed out the the sales uh, issue. Yeah, yeah. The, the downside for anyone who works in like B2B, product management knows is like sales loves putting up <laughs> doorbells in the jungle. They love being like, oh, you know, selling things. It's often called like selling things that aren't on the truck. Um, and those can be r- a huge mess if you're not careful that users might want something that you actually don't have an intent to build. So being just very judicious about where is putting a doorbell in a jungle, an actual test for whether someone wants a product, it should be like both a cheap test and a test you're willing to like sort of build the results of to some extent. Um, it, it shouldn't be something where you're, you know, letting sales run amok <laughs> and put them everywhere and then realize that you've accidentally made customer commitments to build like 50 things that you do not want to build. Yeah. So if you got like doorbells all over the place and they're all ringing and you're like, everyone's like, wait, we don't know which ones of these are actually good. And they're all kind of, it's like, then you're having another problem, which is. <laughs> Uh, one downside of this approach, if you do it. No, another thing I was thinking of as well is that, uh, you know, what what if you have the one doorbell uh, that is consistently rung by one customer, but actually operating the door attached to that doorbell uh, is actually more hassle than this customer is worth. Um, and you kind of think, okay, well, you know, cutting them off seems like good business, but also bad for reputation. So how do you, like, do you maintain the doorbell and the door, so to speak, or do you just like decide, okay, I'm going to cut my losses and get rid of that particular doorbell? I don't know. It seems pretty clear to me <laughs> if it's like if it if it's not the right ROI for your business and a user wants it, um, you can tell the user do all the right relationship stuff. If this is a large user, to be like you know we're, we're unfortunately no, we're not building this. I'm sure you can find a solution elsewhere. Like there, are, I'm sure there are other people who are interested in it. Um, yeah, it, it feels like a like I think this happens all the time. Fortunately, yeah. or unfortunately. And it gets harder the bigger, the large, like if you don't know who that user is, like on the web platform, we'd ship a feature and like, you know, 
then like six months later you'd see like some kind of weird usage stat in the stats like what happened and like you know you broke something in for korean banking sites accidentally and you didn't realize um i think that gets harder because you're like i can't i don't even know who, who the users are i can't go reach out to them and like phone one of them and be like what what are you using this for like what why is this working this way i think there's a uh one of the the bets of this pattern is the users who will crawl through that jungle, through all the bramble bushes to get there are highly motivated. And as a rule of thumb, not always, uh, you can think of like product market fit as a subset of like, it's tied to who your market is. So if, you're, if your market is defined down to a very, very, very small user segment, then you can have product market fit actually way before you think you do because those users are so motivated. It's, uh, they need that thing so badly, they're willing to, to do a very expensive action. And then the bet is that if you make the bar of, uh, of that there are a lot of people who would want this thing but just aren't quite so motivated, and if you reduce the bar, if you make it so they have to crawl through a little bit less of a jungle, like cleaning up the trail or whatever, that you'll unlock more demand. But if that doesn't happen, then you don't invest more on it. Like you, you might, and in fact, you might sunset that feature of like, you know, you build out that, you build that door because one person rang the doorbell and wanted through and you kind of sledgehammer through the wall. And then like, nobody ever comes through it again in like a, a year or two like cool like patch it back up take the doorbell down like don't you know don't leave it there if nobody else is using it you're, you're kind of just trying to catch lucky breaks you're trying to catch uh it's like putting out like a butterfly net putting out a bunch of butterfly nets and the likelihood that a butterfly flies through it at some point in the future um, but if they're expensive to maintain then that's not a good idea like they need to be cheap to, to accumulate kind of reminds me of that idiom that you know if if you build it they will come that if you just put something out there um who knows someone might actually ring the doorbell someone might actually say hey i'm interested in this and i actually re offer a very unique business opportunity to you but yeah it's, it's it's kind of finding the i guess the right balance of um this needs to be cheap enough that it's not going to hurt me if this doesn't work and i've seen a lot of people will sometimes they'll use the if they we build it they will come for like magical thinking for platforms like cool we just spent uh 20 engineers working for a year on this thing that we don't know if anyone's going to want it. And it's like, why do you do that? Like, there's almost certainly like you have, you won't have found something like you want it to be really, really small, easy, like duct taping a thing together, like two pieces that already exist and doing a very simple thing for it. So one of the patterns I found that worked in the web platform space was, Hey, build a little shim or a little like simple little, um, what we called proly fills, uh, and then if people are using that, that's a pretty good sign that like that is an interesting feature that people want. And that is a cheap thing to do because it's just a like, you know, it's a little script that people can include in NPM or whatever. And uh, and then if they like it, that's a pretty good sign that people do would want it if they were on the platform. But like you want to make sure the really small investments that are in response to the actual concrete demand that you have received. Tara, do you have any examples of, uh, like a, I guess, a doorbell that you successfully implemented or something that you've seen somewhere in the wild? Yeah. Um, so I, th I think folks often think of these as especially useful for like consumer products um, where oftentimes, you know, you can't talk to your entire user base. And so you gauge your user's intent via their actions. And, you know, a doorbell in the jungle is useful there. Um, but I've actually seen it useful at Stripe. Like actually the reason <laughs> that Alex and I had had that initial conversation was I had been talking about the um, Stripe issuing product and how Stripe issuing initially was like really not meant to be self-serve, that we didn't really have a self-serve thing out there. Um, but a user had just self-served it. Like they had gone through like doorbell in jungle where jungle was like, you know, 60 miles deep into the like, I don't know, pick like a very <laughs> dense forest, like that forest or something like that. And so they had like hacked their way through it and gotten on the product. And God knows it was like a nightmare to... I'm, I really, you know, admire how much uh, effort they put in and they didn't talk to anyone whilst doing it. And so to me, that was actually what had sparked the, me bringing it up to Alex. And I was like saying, yeah, you know, talk about doorbell in the jungle. Like we had really not intended this use case and this user went ahead and like did literally everything to integrate this product um, and, and got right on board. And so I think we often think about this as a consumer tool, but, you know, it's for me, it's had some applicability in B2B as well. That's one of the things that I think is great about working for most of my career as a product manager. I worked as, um, as sort of a developer facing product manager and developers are interesting in that. And B2B has this to some degree too, of like, these are not just some random people who are like, don't have a strong motivation. They're trying to get something done for their job. Like they really, 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 really are motivated. And that means that in some cases you can like shortcut a bunch of analysis and tools that you would 
have to do with consumers. And so like, you know, that like somebody, like if you, if you would have known to put that doorbell in the jungle, like you'd be like, no one will ever climb through this jungle. But yeah, but it's like super cheap to put like a little doorbell there. So like, let's just do it. And it might, you might actually uncover that people use, like one of the, the trends, I milestones I look at for a, a developer facing product is the first time that somebody in the community uses it for a thing where at first you go, that won't work. And then you see, oh, wait, no, that, that would work. They're using it in a super clever or weird way. Another milestone is when something you learn about one of the uses of your product uh, indirectly. So you discover it on Hacker News without searching for it, or someone you know, sees a cool tweet that's going viral, like, hey, wait a second, they used my thing to build that. Like, that's a really cool milestone that people are doing interesting stuff with what you've built, even if you didn't know about, you know, didn't think about the use case ahead of time. I think it's also just a milestone when when people start using that um, feature that you didn't really intend it to be used, and that in t t turns out being more popular than your actual product itself. So uh, this is one thing I want to talk about, which is uh, at the end of the story in your article, uh, kind of spoiler alert, but the the, the, the fictional company that actually tent pivots away from their normal business into the business that evolved to one of these door uh, doorbells in the jungle. And it, it made me think a lot of um, Slack, where it, it, if people were unaware, um, yeah. mm -hmm. Slack was actually a side project where, where Tiny Spike was originally the company's name. They were, they were building a video game and they built Slack internally because the existing tools just worked great. And then they kind of realized, like, wait a second, this thing that we just built as a hackathon, I think it was, just internally, is actually way better than what we were doing beforehand. And um, that got me thinking a little bit about um, like pivoting, essentially, which is you know, big and scary for a lot of companies. And I want to get your thoughts, uh, maybe starting with you, Tara, on um, how, how should we, uh, how should we like, you know, address or think about pivoting? How should we approach it? Hmm. I think the, in the case of the Slack example, um, I, you know, have no visibility into what was actually going on. I'm like purely speaking as a very, very, very outsider lurker. Um, it seems like the core product the game itself was like not succeeding and this like internal tool was something where it's like hey we're we're sort of on to something we have something cool here and it i think took a lot of intuition but also took a lot of hey we put this thing in the market and we're not quite seeing the response but it seems like we've like hit alchemy on something else and so i think there's an element of in pivoting just being really honest about what the user and the market are actually looking for um we, we mentioned this earlier, but at some point in getting an initiative started, you have to have a conviction that, you know, you believe something that very few others believe, or there's a trend that you're trying to like manifest into reality. And the initial response you're going to get is almost always negative. Um, but there is an element of like, when, when does that like simply, when do you realize that that might not work? And to me, that is the moment of pivot, which is, we've had this thing that we believe to be a core truth, but we've tried and tried and tried. And it seems like either the timing is wrong or the the core truth that we believed is wrong. And we have something else that might be interesting. So let's pivot towards it. Uh, I think that moment can, I think everyone has a different threshold for how much they want to try before making that happen. Um, and oftentimes, as Alex kind of alluded to earlier, a pivot is not, like a decision doesn't always have to be a giant pivot. It can be like, a turning of small degrees at a time. Um, but ultimately, it's kind of that intersection of what is your intuition and then how does user and market feedback update that? Physical, sorry, go ahead, Alex. Sorry, you're on mute. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, that, that totally everything, I agree with everything you said. And I think that sometimes it, it gets to the point where like you're just, you're just changing the in incremental amount of where like incremental investment goes. It gets to the point where like, oh, hey, that thing that like we thought was our main thing is now like below the threshold of like, we clearly don't care about it. Like this other thing took off so much. And sometimes if you found some kind of compounding loop, some kind of network effect or some kind of, you know, thing that's spreading at an exponential rate or whatever, uh, sometimes it's just like, a, oh crap, well, this is clearly something really important and it's, it's an easy decision at that point. Um, so it doesn't have to be this big, oh my gosh, moment. It can sometimes be like actually, and sometimes it does have to be that way. You have to kind of burn the boats behind you. Um, but other times it can be like, yeah, this is, everyone pretty much agrees. Like this is pretty un, uh, unambiguous actually looking at our stats of usage and, and what's actually happening in the market. I think uh, uh, the, the difficult part of it really is um, just swallowing your pride because you were, 
probably very convinced that the thing that you built was going to be useful to people and they would actually give you money for you to continue to working on it. And um, finding out that that's not really what people want is probably a bit of a bit of a hit to the ego, isn't it? Have you guys ever experienced anything like that before where, where the thing that you built you thought was amazing, but it turned out you just dead wrong? Oh, yeah, all the time. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of time that wasn't the case, actually. <laughs> Um, a very notable example is before I came to Stripe, like I, you know, had a failed startup and the startup failed for a couple of reasons. One, I had made this fundamental assumption that like patients are consumers, which they are not like patients of a like a healthcare system are are very much a new type of are a different type of thing, which is patients. And I had assumed that, you know, changing legislation had made patients consumers and it turns out that wasn't the case. Um, but I also was like fundamentally wrong in terms of like, sure, users liked my service, but they weren't willing to pay for it as much. Um, and so I had believed something and maybe in fact was like right about something. Um, but the timing was entirely wrong and like users really didn't seem to resonate with it. And I had made like a fundamentally wrong assumption. And you, you just see that in the, it took me like a year and a half, but you, you see that in terms of the business just not seeing the traction you want, like growth feels painful. It feels like you're like pulling a crank very, very slowly as opposed to growth. You know, early days of Stripe felt like the opposite where we were, you know, dropping leads on the floor because, you know, things were going at such a pace. And so it, I, I think you, you kind of intuitively know the difference and when things are working or not. And actually, in fact, for me, the bigger correction is, um, not overcorrecting based on that reaction. And so for a long time, I was just bearish on like, you know, health tech in general, and like, especially consumer health tech because of what I had learned. And I actually think it's going through that feedback and parsing out the nuances of it and thinking about what works and what doesn't that is like the truly valuable exercise. That totally resonates with me. I think that there's a our own experience around like the ego. If, if you think your ego is tied to like the idea I had is like, turns out to like, I just executed on it. And it turned out to be successful. Like you're going to, your ego is going to get bruised. Like there's no way that's going to work. And I think over time you get, um, you kind of learn it, the, to go back to another cliche, you know, the learning is what's to be celebrated. They're like, Oh wow. Look at all the things I now know and understand. And uh, that you didn't know before, which means that you're going to make way better bets in that in the future because you've calibrated your intuition you've calibrated what you know what things will actually work and i think tara one of the things that was resonating with what you were saying is if you if you make a mistake early and you realize it's like an abject failure and then your ego will kind of overcorrect and you completely throw it under the bias or like avoid it or whatever and later many years later looking back on it coming back to it and going oh actually i was overcorrecting it was it was taking away too strong of a lesson it's actually a more nuanced lesson I, that happens to me all the time. The things that like, you know, I thought if you asked me about, you know, looking three years back, what things I thought were failures of things I worked on. And you asked me like then nine years later, it, it changes considerably about how I take, like what I take away from them. And um, like, you know, I, 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 I feel like every product I worked on uh, almost every single one was a large failure in some significant way. I worked in Google squared. I worked on a feature that never launched uh, for a double click for a year I worked on web platform docs and uh, this thing called Rumble Hornet, Hornet that were just absolute and total unambiguous failures. And uh, I learned a ton. <laughs> like one of the things I learned in open source communities was not to try to structure things too much, like to allow it, like structure in the community should come retroactively, not proactively, because uh, you're like, you can snuff out a community relatively quickly if you try to structure it uh, too, too much at the beginning. But yeah, it's just it's a constant step of like learning, being willing to learn, and like not have it bruise your ego to be like, yeah, cool, I was wrong. I now know a lot more about that thing, and that's cool. At, at the beginning of the show, I asked the two of you uh, what the favorite product is that you've worked on. Tara, for you, it was uh, uh, Stripe billing, and Alex, for you, is um, uh, Live View in in Maps. Did you both have that feeling when you were back? If you can remember back in the day when you were working on those, that you have moments where. Um, you had to slightly pivot the products and clearly it worked out okay if it did happen. But yeah, did you, did you have like in pivots then or was there a pretty clear guide of what to do and how to get there? Maybe we'll start with you, Alex. 
that one actually it's funny the, one of the things that was so great about that team is that we were so good at like navigating the uncertainty together and not pretending like we had a plan in a big chaotic ambiguous space but what's funny is the thing that we shipped actually ended up being very similar to the thing that we thought we were going to ship when we started along the journey uh but we learned a ton and it wasn't like I, I'm very surprised actually in retrospect I was thinking about it I'm like actually that was roughly what we were planning on shipping we just learned a lot in that journey and be uh, about uh, lots of ideas that we didn't ship that turned out to be very bad ideas Wait, were you surprised because it's rare that that happens yeah it's just I, I'm trying to think back to other cases where the thing that ended up shipping was like yeah that actually is what we shipped uh, that's what we intended or thought was going to happen at the beginning and it's really hard to think of examples of that honestly for me How about you, Tara? Yeah, I think for billing, we benefited from the fact that Stripe had done a thing before and it like hadn't quite worked. And so we got to form theses that were both sure our own ideas for what we think the future could have been, but also form ideas in reaction to the past product and understand what worked and what didn't. So we had a little bit of like a a cheat code there in terms of just understanding the past quite a bit and understanding where, where the feedback was. So from the beginning, we sort of had a core thesis for this product of like, this is how this is going to be different. This is why this matters, this is why Stripe can do this better. Um, and I think we've like, I think one of the things that's been kind of remarkable about it is that we've just pushed in that same vein ever since. Like I remember the first ever sort of strategy doc I wrote for that product. I was like, the dream user of this product is Atlassian. And this is how each Atlassian product can like work on Stripe billing. And this is how the future of that will look. And, you know, here's how Bitbucket could bill. And, you know, I think six months ago or something like that, uh, we Stripe put out a press release that, you know, Atlassian is on Stripe billing and uses Stripe billing to power all of its uh, sort of subscription products. And it's like, that was was an amazing moment, but also was a, like, we have been planning for this for quite a while. Like, we, we got a thing right. And I think, again, that that's in part because we really benefited from seeing a thing that went before, but the core vision stayed has stayed the same. Which I feel like is exactly the counter, like, exactly opposite of what we've been saying is how much they change all the time. And of course, our two <laughs> favorite products, which turns out we're like, oh, no, we're pretty much got it from the beginning. Maybe it's because we're so sick of everything changing all the time, but our favorite products are the ones where it's like, you know what? Nothing changed. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing changed. We were exactly right the whole time. Yeah. I mean, welcome to tech, right? Yeah. Okay, so we are in the last five minutes of our time together. Um, what we usually do in the last five minutes is that we give each guest an opportunity to just talk about something that they are currently interested in or something they want to plug or just something that they think that they should bring to everyone's attention. Uh, Tara, maybe we'll start with you. Is there anything that you want to tell these people? Oh, I was like trying to think of something cool and interesting to mention here. And, you know, I hope I have cool and interesting things. But actually, the thing I've been really thinking about a lot is that um, the SEC has released a new proposal that public companies should begin reporting their carbon emissions and reductions progress alongside, you know, financial results with like quite a bit of rigor. And this is exciting in that it means that companies need to start thinking about their their carbon emissions in a more thoughtful way um, and sort of is is a little bit it's quite late <laughs> given that Europe and other places have been thinking about this for quite a while. Um, so exciting to see that movement. It's early. It would apply to, um, you know, companies on the path to an IPO or like public companies. Um, it would kind of require these companies to think about not only their direct emissions, but also emissions potentially from the vendors like that they use. So if you, you know, run on GCP or run on AWS, thinking about the emissions from something like that. Um, and the initial proposal passed three to one, and now it's going to head out for open comments. So if you have somehow, you know, a uh, ability to open comment on SEC proposals, uh, being in favor of this reporting, I think is a great idea for our planet. <laughs> no small ask there. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I, don't, I don't make small ask here. I'm, I'm here for the big ask. Tara, you also, I love how yours is like, a, like good for the planet and mine is like the most like self-serving thing ever that I was going to boost. So thank you for making me feel very... Oh, like, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm, I know. I'm, I'm very altruistic and generous. <laughs> That's a tough act to follow, Alex. Uh, so what you got? Uh, well, great. Mine is just very tactical. It's just, you know, we, we, on the, I'm running the Corpse Rat team here and I, we, we're hiring interesting people with a sort of atypical backgrounds. 
Uh, I never thought I would be doing corporate strategy. Uh, I'm very surprised to find myself in this spot. And so we're looking, I'm looking for other people who are also kind of never really considered doing it. We're doing it in a very different way here. So if uh, anyone's interested in that role, it's um, HBS bit.ly stripe dash corp dash strat. It will take you to a little bit of information about uh, that listing. Um, and yeah, that's no, great. No, it's like such, a, uh, such a dweeb. The other thing I'd say is this weekend, uh, the, the, the uh, doorbell in the jungle essay ended up being like 40% metaphor and like 60% unpacking of that metaphor. And this weekend I sat down, I was inspired to write another kind of strategy blog post. And when I was done, I realized it was kind of like the uh, Captain Crunch, oops, all berries kind of thing. I was like, oops, all metaphor. And so I ended up publishing just a short story about like wandering and strategy and whatever in a very like, uh, without any unpacking of it, which is a very different and new thing for me. Um, that uh, That's called the wanderer and the seeds is what I ended up calling, uh, being called. But So Alex Komoroske fable book when? Yeah, exactly. I don't, know. I don't think it's a good thing necessarily, but yeah, like uh, just someone making little fairy tales uh, in their spare time. It's like how, how, how to teach your child about corporate strategy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with, with illustrations. Actually, my, my husband was like, we should make this into a book that we, for kids. I'm like, what are you, ta- what are you talking about? Like, why don't we do that? But. If you would like to see that book, people who are listening in, um, react right now and just put a, little, put a little heart up on your screen. Yeah, the, the doorbell <laughs> in the jungle, of it, seeing there's any demand for a, a random strategy fable. As a kid's yeah, I was going to say, put up an Amazon page. People can pre-order the book and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Awesome. Well, we are almost at time. Thank you both so much for uh, being on my panel here today. And thank you, everyone in the audience who listened in. This has been Stripe Dev Live. We try to do these every single month. This is the first time we're doing this on Twitter Spaces. Um, we'll probably, we usually do this on Discord, but let us know, like uh, respond to the initial announcement tweet if you preferred this on Twitter Spaces rather than Discord. In any case, thank you so much for joining us. And have a great rest of your day wherever you are in the world and see you next time. Bye. Thank you. This was awesome.